All right, so the Dungeons & Dragons YouTube channel has finally posted a video about their new magic items as well as crafting rules. And I'm super excited about it, so we're going to go ahead and go over that. Um, and for updates on my other videos, we'll talk about those at the end of this, so be sure to stick around. Of Which I know players are super excited for extended crafting rules, and we have a lot of magical items. Can you tell me a little bit about that chapter? Well, let's see. Where do we start? How about the beginning? Um, <laughs> at the beginning of the chapter, we talk about treasure themes, which we can get into. And then we spell out the different kinds of treasure, from coins to word. trade goods to trade bars, which is new to this book, to art objects, gemstones, and magic items. Yes, there are a ton of magic items, including a bunch of new ones, Todd. I know. I'm excited for that. And so that's And there's a lot of art, by the way. Yes. Yes. And as folks are beginning to discover, there is some magic item crafting rules in the player's handbook yes. 2024. You can craft kind simple of. items like potions and scrolls using the rules in that book. So he's not wrong. Yeah, there's rules on crafting these things. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't personally consider a potion a magic item. A spell scroll, sure, fine, whatever, but it's not... It's not what jumps to the front of the mind when you hear somebody say, oh, I'm going to make some magic items, right? Uh, and it's cool. It's it's cool. Don't get me wrong. I like it. I love it, in fact. I know a bunch of my players are going to love using the new crafting system. Uh, but uh, let's not muddy the water with potions and spell scrolls and jump into the real magic items, yeah? What we did in the DMG is we expanded upon that and gave you the rules for crafting everything else. And it's really but pretty straightforward. It works the same as the, the crafting of regular items, non-magical items that's in the player's handbook. Uses your tool proficiencies and your okay. uh, arcana proficiency and the spells you know uh, to help you make the items you want. Yeah. So first of all, as James said, you need to have the arcana skill yeah. to make magic items. Okay. Then that's once fair. you've decided what item you need to make, you have to have the appropriate tool for the job. And so if you are going to make a wand of magic missile, you need wood, uh, what is it? Wood, wood carvers tools, tools uh, which makes a lot of sense. But that's not all sure. that you need, because if a magic item allows you to cast a spell through the item, like a wand of magic missiles, you also have to have the magic missile spell. Yeah. Logical. Yeah. And then, of course, you need gold and you need time. And what are, are there additional rules? Like, are there difficulty ratings for how to do this? Like, how does this go? Yeah, so depending on the rarity of the item you want to create. I saw the immovable rod. I hope that they're not making it so that you can make an immovable rod. Those things are such a pain in the ass to deal with. Um, I hate them so much. I like the idea. <clears throat> it makes sense the way they're doing it. And it's... It's going to trip up new players, um, but as long as there's enough veteran players, or at least a veteran DM, the item crafting system is going to be pretty easy, pretty simple, straightforward. Um, it's kind of limiting for non-spellcasting classes, but, you know, it, it, the party always has at least one spellcasting class with them, usually like three so I'm sure I'm sure that this limit will be fine. You'll just have to pay the the gold amount to whichever party member you have making your magic items, and probably give them a little bit extra for the for the their time, you know. Um, and I do get it. I'm sure there's a way to circumvent that probably in the rules for like if you've got a the spell scroll of whatever magical item you're trying to make, like the the wand of of missiles. Uh, if you got a spell scroll for it. You could probably still do it. I'm sure there's some way to circumvent that for if you don't have any spells at all because you're like a barbarian, you know, or a monk, what have you. But it can cost you more gold or more time. The gold cost is an assumption about the raw materials you need to make the item. And it's possible that if you're in a podunk town somewhere, they don't have those uh, raw materials available. A bigger city, you're more likely to find them. I personally would rule that if you're in a place like the city of Brass or the city of... Sigil? Sigil, 
I wanted to say Sigil, <laughs> and I caught myself. <laughs> <laughs> the city of doors. Nice. Um, that Seigel, Seigel. <laughs> <laughs> That those items, that those, those raw materials are going to be readily available. Perfect. Yeah. So if you're a wizard, it behooves you to be maybe sometimes near town. Yes. And one of the reasons why these rules are in the Dungeon Master's Guide instead of the Player's Handbook with the other magic item crafting rules is because this is unlocked by the Dungeon Master. The Dungeon Master determines whether or not the materials are available, whether or not the characters can build uh, these items. And, and to your point, point, like, you know, the magical item tools are broken down from, like, armor, potions, ring, rod, scroll, staff, wand, weapon, wondrous items. You outline what those tools need to be. Yes. And then on top of everything else, you, you may need assistance, or assistance can at least help. Assistance can help. Yeah. Uh, the time required to make an item is, is basically person hours, so more people means fewer hours. Which, again, can help, you know, if you have a bastion and you've got hirelings, this all kind of ties together. It does tie together. Some, some of the Bastion facilities in the Bastion's chapter specifically interact with crafting uh, certain kinds of items as well. Why is crafting so exciting for people as a player? What, like, why is this such an aspirational thing? Does everyone want to be? That's a stupid question. Everybody wants to be able to make their own magical items. One, it's better than having to shell out all of your gold to buy one. And two, it's better than waiting until the end of every session and just hoping beyond hope that your DM was nice enough to just give you enough magic items for everyone in the party. That's, that's dumb. Everybody wants to make their own items. I've never had a player at my table that didn't want to make their own magical items, right? Um, and I was always scrambling to find new and, and inventive ways to make new magical items or for the players to be able to make magical items. So it's cool that they, they gave us the tools for it. But, like, that's... Tell me you've never played Dungeons & Dragons before without telling me you've never played Dungeons & Dragons before. This is really telling. You know, that he's part of the development team, that, and he doesn't... He, It feels like he's never played before. And it's not just this interview. Every single interview, it feels, it's felt like he's never played Dungeons & Dragons before. I'm sure he has. I'm sure he has. And he's just, like, super, super vanilla about it. But, like... I've never met a player that didn't want to make their own magical items. It's just, especially if they're a spellcaster. Like, come on, be real. Sauron. <laughs> <laughs> so I think there's there's at least two things going on. Yeah. Maybe three. So one is um, finding treasure in your adventures is exciting. Finding gold sure. is exciting and finding magic items is super exciting. Absolutely. When you find magic items, it's always at the whim of the dungeon master. You find what exactly. the DM decides you find. Exactly. And when you find gold, that's exciting until you start saying, okay, I have so much gold, what am I going to do with it? So crafting answers yeah. that question and lets you say, I'm going to yeah, make my own item, not just whatever the DM decides I'm going to find. The second piece of it, I guess, is really that, 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 that I'm taking control. I, I'm going to make something that I want. Exactly. And the third is that there's the potential, at least, for, for putting your own distinctive mark on it. You know, I, I'm making a, a staff of power, but this is what mine is going to look like. I, yeah. I get to decide that. Yeah, And absolutely. the guidelines, that helps me as a player, you know, especially a player who owns the Dungeon Master's Guide, it has me something to look at, like a target. Like, yeah, I might be at level one. But if I have the Dungeon Master's Guide myself, I can look at like something like Bastions or crafting magical items and kind of dream one day. Maybe I can make this thing. Yep. Are you capable of crafting just about anything from the Dungeon Master's Guide? Uh, with one notable exception that comes to mind, and that's artifacts. Yeah, right. Uh, they, are, they are beyond the ability. So I'm glad he said that because artifacts are usually these super powerful magic items that are broken beyond belief they sometimes usually require um attunement um i'm not sure what this is supposed to be but it in for those of you who played baldur's gate 3 but haven't really had a chance to jump into the ttrpg um uh, because you know reasons you don't have friends that, that can gather up regularly or um when you were about to start playing COVID, whatever. Um, the the closest comparison I can think of is, is the Necronomicon, right? Uh, H.P. Lovecraft's Necronomicon. 
in the world of D&D would be considered an, an artifact. It's uh, it's ancient, it's it's evil, but not all artifacts are evil. It would require attunement, uh, and it does magical things. And it's broken, right? Um, it'd be OP, overpowered, to an extraordinary level. Those are artifacts. And obviously you wouldn't be able to make an artifact, because in order for it to be an artifact, it also has to be ancient. You can't make it right now and have it be ancient and it's not an artifact it's magic item it's one of those things where all artifacts are magic items but not all magic items are artifacts right so the of uh characters or most mortals in the world to craft the secrets of their creation are lost to the untold ages and so the dm still has that to hold back so you can't actually be sauron right because the One Ring is clearly an artifact. Well, you, I think, I think in most campaigns you want the DM to be Sauron, not the player. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right. I feel like magic items can often such, be such great plot hooks as well, whether it's an artifact or something else. I, I love to give them something they shouldn't have, like the Wand of Orcus. And they're like, they're being hunted. They can't use it. Uh, and everyone else they know wants it. And they're just trying to get through the day. Right. Yes. And, and with things like that, the DM can build in contrivances so that it's a limited use or limited time that the characters can enjoy this sudden power up uh, where they're, in the case of the Wand of Orcus, creating basically armies of undead. You have the hook of Orcus can recall the wand and suddenly they're deprived of this great toy that they have. But for the time they have it, oh, what a fun thrill. <laughs> They're trying not to use it, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, the beauty of magic items in D&D is that they, they really cover the whole gamut from the Wand of Orcus to a Ring of Protection, where, you know, the, the really simple items that um, you write down on your character sheet, maybe adjust some numbers on your character sheet and you never have to think of again, are, are, are fine and great. Uh, like... Sort of like feats. There, there's some feats that you build your character around, and others you just want to write down and forget about. Yeah. Um, and magic items are the same way. And they're, you know, you're never going to define your character around their ring of protection, but the staff of power. Oh yeah, that that's really aspirational. That's something that's going to change the way you play your character, give you access to a whole bunch of things you couldn't do before, and um, and be much more central and, and it's good that that range exists yeah for for different kinds of players for different styles of campaigns just for the amount of magic items you know you can be as monty hall as you want if you're giving out a bunch of things that are consumable or that that don't have a big impact on the story but save the the items that um that really change your character uh, as rarer seasoning and for those uh, young viewers uh, that, that don't know who Monty Hall is, uh, it's just giving away just too many prizes. Or it's like Oprah, like, looks under your seats. It's just you hand your players a lot of power. And then you may regret a little bit of that later on. <laughs> you will regret a lot of it, if not all of it, later on. And you won't have to wait too long to start feeling that regret. I promise you, I'm speaking from experience here. Too much power in the hands of your players, you will regret. You'll regret it. Yes, yes. Well, as, good as, news, good news, Todd. For you, yeah. we put in a tracking sheet yeah. <laughs> so that you can keep track of how many magic items you have dispensed as a DM in your That's campaign. So cool. And know with good heart that you can go to bed and sleep well at night, that you haven't overloaded or underloaded your characters. Or, yeah, or know that you have and then stay awake all right. night. Yes, plotting how to deprive them of their newfound goods. <laughs> Again, it's fantastic. Shipwreck. Yeah, shipwreck. Uh, also for the magical items, we have a special features list, which I love, which you kind of talk about, you know, who made this? Like, it doesn't just have to be a plus one longsword. It can be... It could be Bob the Elf's plus one longsword passed down through generations. Who? Bob the Elf. Oh, Bob. <laughs> I'm like, it's a Bibli Elf. I'm like, I don't know who this man is. Yes. <laughs> you know, so the singer. The, crea the creator of your item might be an aberration. It might be a celestial. It might be a dragon, a dwarf, some elemental being, a fay, a fiend, a giant, a, a gnome, some undead ear. horror. And then we have like a history. So, we also have, uh, you can make a die roll and determine yeah. if this is part of a prophecy, if this is part of religion, if it's sinister, if it's a symbol of power. And then um, you can add minor properties. 
Yeah, I had a whole conversation with my daughter's girlfriend about this. She was saying, plus one sword is so boring. It's like, it's like a fighter named Bob. And that's exactly right. It's like, what, what makes one fighter different from another is the personality they put onto it. What yeah. makes one plus one sword different from another are these tables, which she didn't realize were in the 2014 DMG, <laughs> but are here as well and uh, can just make even, even those items that don't have a big story impact on your character more flavorful and interesting. Yeah, these minor properties are really cool. Like, <clears throat> they can be a beacon, so you have a bonus action and you can add dim light to this thing. Uh, it's a, comp a natural compass, or uh, it's a delver, it's a guardian, it's harmonious, it's a key, it's a secret message, it's a sentinel. Like, this is all flavor you give to the most mundane magical item. That table is also secretly a common magic item generator because yeah. an item that does just one of those things yeah. and nothing else could easily be a, a common magic item. And then you have the minor properties. You've got like strange material, so, you know, songcraft, temperate, uh, unbreakable, war leader, but, and, a, and all of this. And then you've got quirks too. I love all these tables yeah. because you can instantly make just the weirdest magical item. Yes, uh, just my, my favorite rolls. quirk is the Weird loud always. quirk. The item makes a loud noise such as a clang, a shout, or a resonating gong when used. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You can make a sword that shouts when you're swinging it about. You don't want a sneak attack? That's fine. Let everyone in the room know where you are. Watch them piss their pants as your sword screams at them as it hurls itself towards them. You can do that. I, I want the Warhammer with the loud property. <laughs> the loud quirk. When you miss, it goes wah, wah, wah. I want a venomous dagger perfect for an assassin. The dagger of venom, and then it's loud. It's clang! Like, they don't even know until the first time they use it. Yes. And these, the, the tables, hopefully, uh, clever DMs will be able to riff on them and come up with their own quirks. Like, we've got the loud cover, but what about the, the sinister whispering? Item? Yeah. Um, that's not in here, but that's something that a DM could play with. Like, the dagger that, when you stab somebody, it says, you. <laughs> we'll bleep that out. <laughs> <laughs> so, like... <laughs> you got me riffing on the dagger of venom. So it's like when you, activating the dagger of venom is when you coat it with poison. Yeah. And so imagine that hissing as the yeah. venom spreads yeah, along yeah. the blade. Oh, that's cool. Uh, <laughs> I, I like repulsive. Like it's just yeah, like a, a tentacle would. that you have to hold on to. That's the, the hilt and it's always moving. Like something you're like, oh man. I'm looking at you. I know he just kink shamed you. It's okay. You do you. Ignore him. Tentacles don't have to be repulsive. Okay? This is a safe space. Kind of. Man, I don't really... <laughs> I hate this long sword. <laughs> but it's so good! <laughs> mm, squirmy. It makes me really uncomfortable. <laughs> you've got a very extensive <laughs> artifact section. What makes artifacts different? And you've got, again, you've got tables for... Beneficial properties like the four major ones, minor ones, um, and major detrimental properties. Yeah. Artifacts are as powerful as weapon, as magic items can get. And um, in most cases, artifacts are unique. Not, not always. A DM can have artifacts that aren't unique. Uh, but uh, they're so distinctive that their names alone suggest their uniqueness or their power. You know, the Wand of Orcus black razor this you know spooky starry knight sword yeah. um the eye of vecna you know they they have they they t almost beg you to learn more about the story of their creation and what they can do and who made them and why uh they the artifacts have these stories kind of baked into them so that you understand why someone set out to create something of such power and then the other distinctive thing about artifacts is they have many layered abilities, uh, from minor properties to things that only the most powerful spells in the game can duplicate. And that, that randomness goes all the way back to the beginning of the game, where the idea was basically, yes, the Wand of Orcus has these properties. It, it does these, this, the, this list of things in Orcus's hands. That's right. what it's made to do. But when somebody else gets it, it starts misbehaving.
um, it, it might have clear negative effects on the, the person trying to wield it because it wasn't made to be wielded by that person. It was made to be wielded by orcas. And it might do random cool things as well. Some of these are just classics. You know, when you become attuned to the artifact, you take uh, 8, 8d10 psychic damage. And you, the artifact imprisons, imprisons the death slot. Uh, there's a 10% chance of it escaping the item every time you use it. That stuff I love. I'm looking at the negatives a lot. I'm not I like noticed that. <laughs> I wonder why that is, Todd. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there, are, there are great beneficial traits, too. Yeah, Just like if you're attuned to the uh, artifact, your speed is increased by 10. Who doesn't right. love that? Or you regain hit points faster. Or, yeah. Um, uh, while attuned, you can actually cast a spell you couldn't cast without the item. When you're attuned to the artifact, other creatures can't take a short or long rest while within 300 feet of you. I, yeah, that's a that's a detrimental property. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that means you snore really loud. I don't know. <laughs> or the artifact snores really loud, right, like yeah. the Wand of Arcus is there just like this hellish grinding chainsaw. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, that could be a lot of fun. And this is this is kind of my favorite thing that I grew up with: uh, sentient magical items. I find that charming to have like there's this NPC living in your sword, and you may yeah. not agree with it. That's always fun. Right? Yeah. Like, that you've got a bunch of qualities here uh, for sentient weapons. Yes. Uh, when, when you decide that an item, and it, it doesn't have to be a weapon. Yeah. Uh, you could have a sentient crystal ball. Uh, you could have a sentient pair of boots. That would be weird, but you yeah. could do it. Yeah. Don't um, tread on me. Sentient pair of boots. Mm, bro, you make lots of money over these feet. That's your boots. Have fun with that. Enjoy that nightmare fuel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you can only talk when your feet yeah. aren't in it. Yes. Yeah. But the things you. <laughs> I'm trying to have a conversation here. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so you're a sentient boots. Don't want you to. <laughs> there, there are several important things you need to decide uh, when you do, when you when you when you're going to make an item sentient. You have to know what the item's alignment is because that will help you um, get a sense of its personality and how you're going to role play yeah. it. Uh, you need to know how the item communicates. Does it communicate telepathy or can it actually speak out loud? Um, and uh, what senses does it have? How much awareness of its environment does it have? And then. Uh, does it have any uh, special purpose that it was created for, that it basically drives its own agenda toward? And on top of that, uh, the items also have mental ability scores, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. The reason those scores are important, and this was true in 2014, is because if a conflict occurs between the wielder or owner of the item and the sentient item, there could be a battle of wills yeah. that plays out, um, and uh, if the and how easy is it to get the item on your side and to persuade it not to um, push its own agenda ahead of yours? It makes for a, a fun, a fun little character moment as they're as it's screaming, at, <laughs> as your character is yelling at the sword while the other characters kind of look on awkwardly. It, especially if it's only telepathic, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You're like, <laughs> Everything going on okay, Bob? Yes. But um, uh, when a conflict occurs, uh, the item's bearer has to make a charisma saving throw. On a failed save, the item makes demands mm. uh, that either the bearer complies with or the item can become kind of misbehave a little bit. Yeah. And the demands might be the item wants you to do whatever the item wants. Whatever dream the item has, yeah. you have to basically help fulfill its dreams. Like it's like a glory seeker, a lore seeker, a yes. protector, a soulmate seeker. A... Or the item could be, you know, it's time for us to spend some time apart. <laughs> it's not me, it's you. Yeah, yeah. when your master yeah. breaks up with you. <laughs> you need to help me find a new and more worthy uh, possessor. Yeah. And, Oof. Yeah, tough, yeah. tough times. Excalibur is like, no. <laughs> Pass. Sorry. <laughs> Who gave me to you? <laughs> this is yes. this isn't right. Um, I love I love that stuff. And now we have so much magical item art. There and there's a lot of new magical items. We always had a lot of magical items in D and D, but uh, I'm really excited being able to kind of see some of these re realized. I really like the bag of devouring winky face. Yeah, yeah. we made we made a list near the beginning of this process of the items that weren't illustrated that we wanted to be illustrated and items where we thought we could do maybe a, 
a, a more on point illustration or show the show the item in a different light or a different way. Right. Uh, to show, um, for instance, with weapons, make sure that we're kind of showing a more diverse array of weapons than we did in the 2014 DMG. So there was a lot of upfront conversations about, okay, how much art can we squeeze? How much more art can we squeeze in? And then what are those? What should those pieces be? I, I was glad this time around that we illustrated a bunch of potions. Yes, because there weren't hardly that any is, potion illustrations yeah. in the 2014 book and we got so many beautiful cares, ones right? um, the, including one for a new magic item around. called the potion of pugilism yeah, well, it's green as green as spinach yeah for the kids out there that's a popeye reference <laughs> yeah. i'm strong to the finish because i eat my spinach <laughs> yeah. I, i'm old i didn't need to be reminded that i was that old <laughs> see that was free <laughs> Uh, there's some, like, I love the charlatan die with the rat yeah. standing oh, over yes. it. Yes, the pirate rat. Oh, the, the pirate rat. The, the pirate rat. Oh, my gosh. so charming. It makes <laughs> some of these magical items, like, the, the hat of vermin. We have this lovely toad sticking out of this. Yes. This yes. Very well, the rat of hat. vermin was in Xanathar's guide. We yeah. picked that up oh. along with a bunch of other common yeah, items. Of, yeah. And put them in here because one of the other things we knew well from the 2014 was, book is that um, we didn't have a Xanathar's lot of common guide, items. Uh, yeah. And so to, to give that rarity its due, oh, we pulled a bunch of the Xanathar's yeah. uh, guide to everything it's items into here and then created a few new ones as well. We do have playing a new magical item, playing a warlock. Uh, love, the of of ah, yeah, I love the cauldron of rebirth. I love the creepiness of a warlock being able to resurrect anyone with a raised dead spell. One of my favorite things about this chapter is we were able to shoehorn in yeah. descriptions of all of the magic items that were from the animated cartoon in the 80s that hadn't already appeared in the book. Sheila's Cloak of Invisibility Not was in the book already. Yeah, but now we got, you know, now we got Hank's energy bow. Exactly, yeah. and we've got an illo of Hank yeah. aged up a little using that bow. We've got an illo of Presto aged up a little using his hat of many spells. And um, getting as many iconic characters into the 2024 books has been a goal of ours from the very beginning. Um, and. Uh, what that does is it helps um, folks who are new to the game get a sense of the legacy of the game and that these fantastic characters are out there and they exist in the worlds of D. That's cool. Uh, a lot of my players didn't even know that there was an animated series from the 80s. Um, and when I told them, they also didn't really care, um, which is fair. It was good for its time. I watched it, uh, let's see, I, I watched it in 98. Um, cause, yeah, because I was six at the time. Um, and it's okay. It was good for the time, but nobody cares about it now. Nobody cares that there was an animated series in the 80s. These references are not for the new players, like he said. It's for the veteran players. It's for us, uh, you, you know, all of us old fogies, right? People that know about the animated series, they've seen the animated series. It's for us. It's for us. D and D. I don't remember Haggai being in there. I like Haggai quite a bit. The Haggai is an example of a magic item that used to live in the monster manual and didn't belong there. Okay. It was in the Hag yeah. entry, um, so we uh, put it in the magic the among the magic items where it belongs. Oh, Nessie. perfect. Yeah. Funny thing about the Haggai is that. Uh, the illustration we used for it appeared, I think, in the index of the 2014 Dungeon Master's Guide. It was commissioned originally as the Medallion of ESP. It's too creepy to be a Medallion of ESP because it looks like an eye. <laughs> yes. And so I remember sending a, sending a picture to Wes Snyder and saying, could this be the Haggai? He's like, yes. <laughs> so it is now the Haggai. Well, it's nice seeing like the lantern re revealing realized and you know, the javelin of lightning. Um, and this is all, again, this is all aspirational content for a player. This is yes. like a, like, you're, you're not shopping for these magical items, really. And, but though you do give prices on a lot of these. The treasure chapter talks about what items cost. Yeah. Um, when you're buying or selling them, um, assuming. I want to, I, they might say this, I don't know, I might be jumping the gun here, but I want to make this very well known. It doesn't matter what the DMG says the price of a magical item is. Doesn't matter. The the DM decides the price of any magical item, any artifact. The DM gets to decide because one, you may not be able to, you may not get it, right? 
They may not want you to have it, but it's there anyway, right? That way you have a chance to steal it. Um, but also, prices are going to depend, you know, wherever you are in the world, right? It doesn't matter what the what the DMG says on prices for magical items. That's more of a guideline for, for DMs to follow. And for the most part, we'll follow it to the letter because it's usually, like, fair-ish, right? But a lot of times they're like way too way too expensive. And so we lower the price. And sometimes it's like, okay, well why is this magic item, you know, two hundred gold when it does it when it gives you the wish spell? Like that's not okay. That's gotta be way, way, way more, right? It, it's a guideline. It's a guideline that for the most part we follow, but we don't have to. So, new DMs. Keep in mind you do not under any circumstance have to go with that price going to change it i would keep it near that price don't go too too high don't go too low the prices are there for a reason but that reason is a guideline and the dm uh, says they're available yeah and that there's somebody willing to buy it uh so there's you, you know now what all the costs of the items are now that information was actually in the 2014 dmg as well we've just done yeah, a better job of surfacing it um the other thing that's important to point out is that all the items that we picked up from the 2014 DMG, every one of them has been revised in some way right. uh, to make it uh, easy, more fun at the table or easier to use at the table or some combination of the two. Uh, so no, no, stern, no stone was left unturned. Every item got the hairy eyeball. And especially the Haggai. Especially, especially the, Haggai. the Haggai, yeah. Yes. <laughs> There's one other sort of weird in the weeds thing. Chris was mentioning um, in, in the art, making sure that more weapon types were represented. But um, in the rules of the magic items as well, there are a bunch of, um, of magic weapons that used to be any sword. And the rules of the game actually never told you what a sword is. Mm. Is a scimitar a sword or not? Right. Um, so that now. I understand where he's coming from here. Um, <clears throat> common sense tells you what a sword is, right? Nobody's going to come to the table and be like, oh, this dagger is a sword. No, it's a dagger, right? Dude. Common sense will tell you whether or not it's a sword, right? I do understand where he's coming from, but, like, whatever. Nobody's going to come up to, to you with a knife and be like, I want to make this a plus one sword. It's not a sword. No, like, it, no. No, nobody's gonna do that, right? But like I said, I do, I do understand where he's coming from. Unfortunately, uh, common sense is severely lacking in this day and age. But also, um, there's always those people that want to worm their way around the rules as written. Now, all those items now say. A specific list of items that is longer than you might expect it to be. So now you could have a glaive of sharpness, not just a long sword um, or or something else like that. Yeah. So it, every any weapon that is basically sword-like, we just listed them. Yeah. Thanks for pointing that out, James. And like you say, uh, wherever possible, we tried to broaden it so that the the magic item could apply to more things than it used to. Yeah, in some cases, like I mean, just say any one. weapon. Yeah, you know, not everyone is shooting a wants yes. to shoot an arrow of dragon sling. They may have a bullet of dragon sling. Exactly, and so you know, stop bringing up bullets. You took away my artificer. I'm gonna bring the artificer back. Don't worry. As soon as I have the DMG in hand, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a, a video bringing the artificer back. Don't worry. Don't worry. That's that's already at the top of my list of things to do when I get the DMG. So. For those of you who are as upset about the artificer not being in the player's handbook as I am, don't worry, got you covered, eventually. In a way, we've actually crammed a lot more magic items into the book than it appears by virtue of that change alone. Yeah, by removing those limitations. God, it is a lot of magical items. It's not like I, I love seeing this Orb of Dragon kind art. It just kind of like sets your imagination off. And I again, like what you said about the potions, you. They all have such a interesting environment inside of them. Yes. Like the potion of fire breathing uh, just looks like a, a cinder cloud above a fire. The potion of invisibility is also very uh, yeah, he, <laughs> much one of my favorites. I know. There's nothing in it. <laughs> sure there is. <laughs> there is something in it. You just but can't it's see empty. It.
And if you shake it, it probably sloshes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, there, it, is, it does contain something. You just can't see what it's it is. It's an easy perception check to figure out what that potion is. Right, yes. And a lot of these, really, yes. theoretically. Yes. Uh, so now you have guidance for them. One of my favorite new allos, I think, is for the instrument of illusions. I have a thing about hurdy-gurdies. <laughs> <laughs> Can confirm. Of course you do. <laughs> Wait, so... <laughs> Some random video showed up on my Facebook feed like several years ago of just this beautiful music coming out of this instrument. It's a, a pretty amazing instrument. And since then, I'm pretty sure the, the uh, Instrument of Illusions is the second hurdy-gurdy that I've worked into D&D art. All right. I don't want to just keep on talking about every piece of art. There is a ton of magical item art. And the whole chapter is beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Trish Yoakum is one of our uh, great graphic designers who've, who's worked with us for so long and done so much fabulous work. And she really outdid herself. Uh, on on this book, yeah, yeah. it's just you lovely to see. I hate the talking doll. You hate the talking. doll? I don't hate the talking doll. It's super cute. <laughs> we tried. We, did, we tried not to make it super creepy or anything. I know that's my we, instinct. We went out of our way to make it kind of cuddly and just fun. give it a big growly voice. Yeah. <laughs> but it is right next to the uh, tentacle rod, and that's a little under. It doesn't help. <laughs> and Bobby's thunderous great club. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Pondo polymorph is fantastic. Some of this, so some of this art was in the 2014 book. We've just yeah. uh, reframed it and kind of um, uh, positioned it differently so that it feels fresh. And then we have all those tables for like what you find when you find it and stuff like that. Shall we talk just very briefly about the themes? Because they sure. do relate to another book coming out. Yeah. Um, so the, the random magic items tables are grouped into four categories of items. There's arcana, implements, armaments, and relics. So... In the monster manual, when that comes out early next year, uh, every monster entry is going to have a, a treasure entry that indicates what kind of treasure a monster is likely to collect. So if you see oh, Arcana okay. there, that tells you something about the kind of magic items you're going to find there. Yeah. It also suggests maybe the monster has a lot of gems. When you figure out the monetary value of his treasure, that money might be in the form of gems, because Arcana and gems go together. Um, Whereas if you see relics in another one, that's a different set of tables of magic items and a different kind of uh, more likely to be art objects for their monetary value. It's just a way to help the DM make treasures more thematically flavorful for, for themselves and for the kind of monster that you find the help treasure Help make them with. feel like they make sense. Yeah. Yes. It's also helpful to the DM so that uh, the DM can think about the different types of characters in the party. Like arcana items are generally going to be more useful to wizards, sorcerers, warlocks, whereas implements, which are very utilitarian, are probably going to benefit, uh, you know, uh, classes like rogues. Uh, and so as the DM is populating their adventures with treasure and magic items or thinking about giving a magic item to a character, uh, you can they can narrow down the list with the aid of these very helpful classifications, because armaments are fairly clearly weapons, shields, armor. Fighters are going to love them. Um, paladins are going to love them. Uh, relics, druids, and clerics are going to love them. It, it's just another way for the DM to sort of uh, sift through the vast amount of magic items and winnow down to the ones that are actually going to be applicable to, applicable. That. Yeah, yeah. to that character. And yeah. it's helpful, too, if you're creating a character at a higher level to play in a one-shot. I love that. I love that so much. I know that was one of my hardest things as a new DM was trying to decide what uh, what loot the party was going to get after an encounter. So the the table, this this treasure table that they're having and that's going to be part of the monster manual uh, is a fantastic idea. And I support it 100%. Like, it's probably one of the best ideas I've heard from any of these videos so far. Uh, and it makes me more excited for that monster manual to come out early next year. I think, I think they, I think, I can't remember the exact date, but last I heard it was supposed to be in February, which is still technically early next year, but it's like, why, why, why? Like, this is no longer the 2024 rule set because, the, you know, I'm not going into that. Shot or start a campaign at higher level using the advice that's now in the player's handbook about how many magic items you start with. There's advice in here about one way to to approach figuring out what those magic items are is to roll on on the table that's for the category that's appropriate for that character. That's gonna be so helpful. Thank you so much for watching. All right. <clears throat> so 
overall, this is great. I love how they added so many more magic items. Uh, the the rules for crafting magic items aren't overly complex like I thought they were going to be. I still do believe that new players are going to have trouble uh, implementing them, but with some veteran players around to help them out, as well as the DM helping a little bit more than usual, um, I, I have a very standoffish way of DMing. Like I, I help my players when they need help, but also for stuff like that, I want them to be able to grow as players, so they need to learn how to do this stuff, right? Uh, I would still step in and help them in this particular scenario, obviously, but it's like I, I've got some friends that have DM'd, and, and they'll tell the players what they feel they should do on their turn, like in combat. I won't do that. Mm -mm, you gotta figure it out on your own, right? Uh, but the the rules aren't too complex. People will pick them up pretty easily, uh, and that's good. The the fact that we don't have to come up with as many magic items because the book has so many and all the art on it is so beautiful is a fantastic thing. Um, so all in all, this is another like thumbs up for, for this DMG. It's already turning out better than the Player's Handbook, uh, which the Player's Handbook is still fantastic, don't get me wrong. Um, I have... I have read through probably about 80% of this monster of a book, right? It's it's big. It's bigger than the 2014. It's almost twice the size of the 2014. It's 384 pages, right? Um, and there, obviously there's some things I don't like about it, obviously. Uh, <clears throat> Ranger class. Um, but it's got a lot of good things going for it. And, but it sounds like the DMG has even more good things going for it. So I'm super excited for it to come out next month. Uh, Videos coming out in regards to the Player's Handbook, the 2024 Player's Handbook. The the poll on my community page, it looks like uh, Character Creation has won that, that vote, so that will be my next video. I have already finished recording it. Uh, I hit a, a couple snags on editing. I'm almost done with the editing, and then this video came out, and I'm like, okay, well, I've got to cover this video. Um, these reaction videos take significantly less editing, because I'm just clipping out parts in the beginning and the end, usually. Um, so, that's why this one's coming out when it is. I'm hoping... I'm not hoping. I, I know for a fact the character creation video is going to come out Saturday. Now, I'm doing it on my whiteboard. I don't have any of the 2024... Uh, character sheets right now so this isn't going to be me making a character it's gonna be me walking you through how to make a character uh, by kind of explaining some of the rules and the way some of the the nuances of the new character creation works um, so look forward to that it's gonna come out uh, let me look at my calendar because I'm bad with dates. It's going to come out Saturday, October 12th, 2024. So if you're watching this and it's October 12th, 2024 or after that, go to my go, go to my profile. Give me a follow. Um, it'll be there. It'll be on my video list. I promise it will. So get excited about that after that i will be going over some of the new feats that that i think are overly broken i'll be doing a couple shorts on some some feats that way i can get more more videos out um but those are my next two long this is my this video is gonna be my next long form which is you know can come out when it comes out and then the character creation is gonna be my next long form is coming out saturday october 12th so get excited remember to give me a like share if if you have any comment whatsoever on this DMG, please comment below. I'd love to talk about it. Uh, but otherwise, thanks for watching.